The health and well-being of people is largely dependent on the environments in which they live, access to clean drinking water and sanitization, and the foods in which they consume. As many cultures around the world have reflected, food is the first medicine. In indigenous communities, traditional foods are a direct link to the lands and waters in which they come from. To be food sovereign means that one can harvest outside one's proverbial door. All I talked about in the 20 years that I was gone living in the cities was my fish camp and trap line. That's all I talked about, like, I wanna go home, I wanna go home. And I finally was like, I'm going home. And when we went to this elder's fish camp on the Yukon, I couldn't even go to my fish camp at first. I actually had to go to my daughter's family's fish camp. And it, what happened was like, it was like my mom and I and the kids, we, we, like, we started connecting on this total different level because once you're out on the land and you unplug from society, like that's how you connect to the spirit. You know, that's how you connect to the land. That's when you realize who you really are. And we began to just be more simple. We appreciated each other. We appreciated the being able to put up the salmon. And, you know, the next, the next couple summers, I worked on building fish wheels and going to my fish camp. And when I put up fish in my grandpa's smokehouse for the first time in 31 years, like, that was the most satisfaction I had ever felt in my life. No degree, no fancy award at work, no amount of money could ever measure up to that feeling that I had when I was like, my grandpa would be so proud right now. <laughs> I think about, you know, if my wife says, oh, can you go to the store? Can you get a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk? You know, I get in the car and think about that milk and that loaf of bread and I drive to the store and I get it. And once I've purchased it, I'm thinking about home and I'm driving home. You know, and this occurred to me one time when my wife then said, oh, you know, what did you see along the way? And I couldn't answer. I didn't know. Because my mind's eye was on that gallon of milk, on that loaf of bread, on the, the conclusion, the goal of my journey, right? And, and then it was on the conclusion of my journey, getting home and, and being successful you know, in my supermarket harvest. <laughs> if I go into the woods and I'm like, hmm, I'm gonna get five gallons of berries today and I'm gonna just go out there and get it. You know, I, I'm that goal-oriented mind, you miss the berries along the way. You miss the plants that are right there revealing themselves to you, saying, look at me, choose me, pick me. You know, so the act of wild harvest is really this invitation to be present, to slow down, to take a breath, um, to engage with the landscape and um, listen, right? And, and I think that presence of mind, um, that intention that goes along with harvesting, it supports its spiritual healing. All my life I've been taught uh, the medicinal properties of our, our traditional food. Uh, everything is medicinal. Uh, the most plants are in one way or another. And then the birds and the animals all eat those plants. So. It's real important uh, for elders. My, my elders like willow, willow grouse, rough grouse, because they eat willows, and willows have natural aspirin in there. So it's, it's good for your arthritis. And the spruce hen has got, eats spruce needles, uh, pine needles, so he's got a um, antiseptic. That's what you get from, you get a, it fights infection, uh, spruce, spruce sap. You make spruce bow tea for a sore throat and a cold. It's got a natural mentholatum in there, like a Vicks, like you get from the store. So um, then uh, 
The moose eat it, eat willows and a different variety of plants. So my mom always makes me get the moose stomach out, the book and the Bible, because those are concentrated with the willows and, and the greens that they eat. So that's medicine. So when they eat those, that, that makes them feel really good. Whitefish is a um, natural probiotic. It helps make your stomach right. So pretty much everything that you eat out, in, out on the land, your traditional foods is healthy for you in way many more ways than people realize. Well, I think as parents and grandparents, you know, at an early age, just uh, best you could instill healthy eating in, in the kids and tell them like why you don't want to load up on a bunch of sugary drinks. And it's like those TV ads, you know, drink milk or water and some of those educational things. And, can lead, you know, stays with a child for a long, long time, even into adulthood. If you, if you think about, like at your age in life, what was your first memory? And a parent or grandparent or elder teaching you something. You know, kids are obviously more smarter than we think or that we forgot as a, adults, you know. Um, and, and then try to enhance these programs communally through the tribal councils or people being self-determined and wanting to do something for themselves. And as these kids grow and work their way into these positions, and like I said, nothing is impossible might be challenging, you know. And I think that's the long answer to what can we do, you know, as parents, individuals uh, that want to be healthy. In Alaska, a long history of commodity food imports has decreased the value and consumption of many traditional foods. In some areas, the gathering and preparation of many plants has been forgotten or not practiced on a regular basis. By reestablishing and harvesting these foods, the medicinal and health properties of plants and animals alike can bring valuable sustenance to the body invigorate the mind and spirit, and connect people to the lands and waters from which the food comes from, through oftentimes intense physical activity. When I think about the future, and what that holds, I guess I default to or remember you know, the framework of decision-making that I think has, is kind of true across many of the indigenous cultures to consider each action of our own through the lens of seven generations. And I've been asked like, oh, what's seven generations? I think many of us know, but for those that don't, you know, it's like basically the longest yardstick of the human experience, right? So it's, it's my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, me, my daughter, my great, or my granddaughter and my great granddaughter, seven. That's seven generations. And they, if in a healthy community we could all be alive at one moment, maybe, I don't know, but it's, it's what's tangible or directly connected to my experience, our, our individual experiences as people on this earth. And so when we make decisions aligned with that, how would my great grandmother approach this? You know, then hopefully I, the decision I make today will mean that, you know, it's serving my great grandmother, granddaughter. So I think when considering the, the future, if we apply that lens, you know, there's the decisions that come out of that framework are, are very different. You know, I, in Western culture, it's more common to think about you know, our individual selves, you know, the, 
the lone cowboy, you know, self-determination, self-create, you know, the world is yours to create and cultivate. But when we're thinking about cultivation of the well-being of our community and the well-being of future generations, like, we're going to make different decisions. And so I think the, that that is an important thing that every one of us can choose to do. The ways in which we engage with the land, how we harvest, why we do what we do in our communities. Um, it, is, it is steeped in tradition and history and science, our, our traditional indigenous science. We weren't just out there doing whatever we wanted. It was based on observation. It was based on um, trial and error. It was based on you know, passing on and intentional you know, internships to share and cultivate the knowledge. And so wherever we are at today, I think it's any one of us to tell ourselves that we are enough and that our voice matters, I think is really important as we think about the future of Alaska's food um, and the, the continuation of our culture and our communities in a healthy way. And so it's not just about like the physical health of eating traditional foods, it's also the connection and the spirituality. Like when you eat fish, do you just eat the fish or do you actually like smell it and like look at it and like think about where it came from, whose hard work went into making it. Also, like when you're putting up fish and you're preserving it traditionally, like you have to pay attention to it and check on it multiple times throughout the day. It's like, it's like a part of you, right? It's like a child in a way. So, you know, traditional foods, that's, that's who we are. That's what we're meant to eat. And that's what our body needs, that's what our mind needs, that's what our spirit needs. And it's not just about eating the foods, but it's about going out on the land and harvesting those foods and thanking the land for providing for you, right? And taking care of the land. I think that's what we've gotten away from is like with all of colonization and Western systems, we're so tied to our jobs, our computer, our cars, our box houses, our bank accounts, right? Like, are we tied to the land in that way? You know, and that's what we need to fight for. You, you have to have hope. There will be challenging times. There will be hard times, but without hope and without keeping an eye out for the light at the end of the tunnel, you have no choice other than laying down and dying. Things will be challenging, but you can make the best out of a bad situation and laugh and share and don't be so downtrodden worrying about something out of your control. Make, stay on the light side. There's always been stories of elders talking about the problems that we're in now. They were coming. And my grandma did talk about it also. She said that I needed to teach my kids how to live off the land. She told me that when I was young because that's what we're gonna end up going back to. She said, in the end, that we're going to have to be able to live off the land. So gardening and self-sustaining and sovereignty is, is going to be the end game in a lot of elders' minds in the past, the predictions. So I uh, never argue with my grandma. So I, I listen to her very good and I try to do what she told me and live my life that way. It seems to be working out pretty good. So. I, I really miss my grandma and her words. By connecting to indigenous and grown food sources, people arm themselves with nature's first medicine. 
in a time of global pandemic, shifting climates, and economic security for many, food sovereignty and security is more crucial than ever. The foundation is the, the cultural and traditional knowledge and your being that's going to be your foundation you stand on in conjunction with, um, you know, some of the Western education to use that tool to protect your interest. Um, the written word and the paper is all powerful and when you can emphasize where you're coming from, your heart and soul as a native person into a court of law or um, any other state or federal forum or negotiation, that's all powerful. Um, so, Um, when we were getting the farm going and enhancing the traditional foods on the land, that was very evident. Um, without a balanced approach, um, we wouldn't have made a lot of advances in these areas. So well, that, that would be my uh, advice based on personal experience. I mean, we, we always, I always hear this over and over. Elders always say it to the young, you know, kids and young people, go get educated and come back and work for us, you know. So I'm not the first to say it, you know been said over and over and over. I can just uh, reiterate it and re-emphasize it. In, in the, the mental part, uh, spiritual, spiritual part is, is to me is the, the memory and uh, the stories and where, where the food brings you back to uh, spending and sharing with your elders that are no longer around right anymore. That's the big spiritual part. Uh, it brings back memories and uh, the food always bring people together. It's very important. That's uh, why when, when somebody dies in our area, we always try to get a moose and have a, a gathering a potlatch or to uh, celebrate the life and to enjoy good food, to make ourselves feel better and to help with the hurt and the pain. It's a big part of our life. So, uh, Living off the land is, is a really good, healthy way to live and to raise children. It's, it uh, was, you couldn't go wrong uh, how many people used to live on our lands. It, 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 uh, you feel the vibrancy, the vibrations of the world around you and you um, see the world differently. And, I, and in, in that practice, you know, I hear things differently, you know, my mind quiets, I feel things differently, and I, I think, you know, those are the moments when my ancestors are speaking to me the most, the strongest. And so then, then culture is being practiced, and, you know, my identity is strengthened, and so then, you know, my intellectual health is, is bolstered um, by the action. And then I actually eat the food, and oh, it's like, it's, it, you know, nutritionists and Western science is catching up to what we've known, which is that the food is better. And it's just, you know, because it's more nutrient dense um, and it's richer and it's fresher. Um, and so, you know, I think about another story I like to think about is like um, when we eat rose hips, right? Um, they are really high in vitamin C. And so, you know, they help to boost our immune system and help us keep, keep us healthy in that way. Um, but they're also very rich in iron. And when you consume both of them together, your body, Western science has shown that your body absorbs more of it, of both, actually. So they become more bioavailable to our systems to absorb it and be held by our system rather than just passing through our bodies. 
you know, and that's the benefit of our traditional foods is that there are these complex relationships happening within the food and between us and the food that is both nourishing and healing and medicinal. Like it's, it's all of it wrapped into, you know, one. So it's, it's central to, you know, our healing, our culture, our identity, the continued practice of who we are and, and who we want to be moving into the future. We have to be coming from a same set of values. And so our job is to not only teach our young people, but we need to teach everybody really. So when I envision the work I'm doing, it's about creating a space where I'm teaching my indigenous people, but also all community people, but also at the university level. So people that are coming to UAF, for example, to get their education, they can have an experience at our, one of our seasonal camps where they're going to take that with them for the rest of their life. Like people's lives can literally change in one day, in one hour, with one moment, right? So providing people that moment to learn something like that, to, be exper to experience something like that, to be exposed to it, like that is how we start to change the value system.